come. Because blessed is the name Yahweh, King everlasting. Hallel, Yah, Hallelujah. Abba Yahweh, we come to you now at the start of your set apart day, your Shabbat day, Abba Yah, that you blessed us with. To rest, Abba Yah, to bask in your glory and your greatness. And we say, Toda Rabbah Abba. Toda Rabbah Abba for blessing and keeping us through the week, bringing us to the start of your Shabbat. Protecting us, ordering our steps, Abba Yah, blessing us with everything we could possibly need. We thank you, Abba Yah, for those that are traveling, that you put your head of protection around and we ask that you deliver them safely, Abba Yah, to their destination as they come together. Put your hedge of protection around all of us, Abba Yah, that are gathered together in your name. And we ask that you bless us with your Ruach HaKadosh. That we are sufficiently fed, Abba Yah, by your word. That we're washed clean, Abba Yah. And that we gain wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, first and foremost, of whose we are, your set apart people, Abba Yah, your children. You are our Elohim, you are our high tower, you, Abba Yah, sustain us. You are the source of our life. And we give all praise, honor, and esteem to you. And we just ask, Abba Yah, that you bless this convocation tonight, this coming together tonight, Abba Yah, in reverence of you, we ask that you bless us with your Ruach HaKadosh, that you lead us in truth. Inspire Adon Kanakya, Abba Yah, with your words, that he deliver your words the way you want them delivered, Abba Yah, and that they reach their target. We also thank you, Abba Yah, for all the testimonies and all the praise reports, Abba Yah, of your greatness and of your mercy and your grace. We ask, Abba Yah, that you please forgive our forefathers for their missing the mark, for their trespasses against you, for their transgressions and wickedness, Abba Yah, that trickle down to us. And we accept the punishment and we just ask Abba Yah as we learn the error of our ways and we repent that you forgive us. Cleanse us, Abba Yah, and shape us into vessels of honor once again, that we can walk in your likeness, Abba Yah, in your image and shine light unto your majesty, Abba Yah. Be a beacon to our lost brothers and sisters, Abba Yah, and be an example to the world that they will once again, Abba Yah, Praise your name. All your creation will know you again, Abba Yah, without a doubt. Blessed are you, Yahweh. Blessed is your name, Yahweh, and blessed is he that comes in your name. Halal Yah, hallelujah. Amen. Uh, don't knock you out. You have the flu. Oh, uh, Shabbat Shalom. Uh, um, do we have one? Do we have any uh, praise reports at this time? Shashmar. So I our praise to the Most High. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. I just want to get praise to. To the Most High, yeah, you know, for life, for another Shabbat day. Also to give him praise, you know, just for, um, you know, his truth, his Torah. Um, I was at work today and I heard a supervisor, you know, tell some of the people, he said, why, you know, just be an underperformer at work, you know? 
And I was thinking about it in a spiritual sense, you know, like in this walk, you know, why be an underperformer in a walk when, you know, there's this opportunity to be greater, you know, in this walk. So that's something I've been meditating on, you know, today. So I'm gonna give all praise to the Most High for, you know, allowing me to see, you know, certain things and view certain conversations from a spiritual uh, point of view. So I give all praise to the Most High, yeah. Oh yeah. Dang, King, hallelujah. Ima Audrey, floor is yours. Shabbat Shalom. First of all, I'd just like to give all honor and all esteem to Abba for keeping us another week, for blessing and protecting us, keeping us safe from hurt, harm, and danger, and walling us in from the time. And I had an experience this week. Um, I try to be in bed by 10 o'clock. And on the second night of this week, I was, I was preparing to go to bed and I remembered that I had laundry in the washing machine and I decided I would dry it. And I know it was just the goodness of, of Alba because normally I'd go to bed and I'd dry it later. And when I went in the laundry room, the hot water heater was leaking and it's a 40 gallon tank. And had I gone to bed, all 40 gallons of that water would have been flooding the laundry room and my den. So I ran across the street and I got my neighbor and he came over and he turned uh, the water off at the valve that was leading to the hot water heater. And it was still dripping just a little bit, but I had a bucket under that. And I said, well, you know, I just keep checking it. So I, I thought about turning the faucets on, the hot water, for the hot water at the sinks in the bathroom, because if the water's coming out of the faucet, then there'll be less water that's probably draining from the hot water heater. So when I did that, the water stopped dripping at the hot water heater. So I mopped a little bit of water up that was on the floor and I went to bed. And when I got up the next morning, I called a plumber about 7.30 and he told me that I could turn the hot water faucets off because if the water was off of the valley, it shouldn't leak. But I knew that it had been leaking, so I did what he said do. And it was too early for me to get up, so he told me he'd come by lunchtime and take a look at it. So I lay back down and I fell asleep. And while I was asleep, I had a nightmare. And in this nightmare, I woke up and the whole house was flooded with water and it was leaking from the ceiling. It's like, well, why is the water coming from the ceiling? And I kept saying, y'all, why is this happening? Why? And Anyway, I woke up and I was relieved to realize it was a dream. However, when I went into the laundry room, the laundry room was flooded because I had turned the faucets off, you know, for the hot water. So I ran back in the bathroom and turned the faucets back on and I got a bucket and started mopping the water up or what have you. But I'm just so grateful that the first time that I felt led to go in the laundry room that night before I went to bed to discover the leak. And then I'm so grateful that y'all warned me through a dream that the, the laundry room was flooded. So I just thank him. I just praise him because I have talked to other people who had that experience and their, their flooring and everything was just damaged and what have you. So I'm just so grateful, so thankful that y'all spared me that cost and that expense. So I just praise him and give him all honor. Hallelujah. All praise to the Most High. Um, does anyone else have any other praise reports before we get started? Uh, Imash Shoshana. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Praise Yah for his love his mercy, his chastisement. This week I had a dream and I, I'm so thankful he loves us so much. I had a dream and in the dream, um, someone, some people, <clears throat> I was in a group of people, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, somebody asked me my age and I told them my age and they were like, no way that you're that age, no way. And they just kept going on and on about it. 
And as they were going on, on and on, I began to pose like I was in a photo shoot. And when I woke up, I didn't think about the dream when I first woke up, but later on that day, the dream came back to me and I saw myself pose and I said, oh my father, forgive me. I've been vain about how youthful I look. And it's not me, it's you that's restored my youth, you that keeps me youthful, you that keeps me strengthful, you that heals me, delivers me, guides me, everything I've got, everything about me. And I thought about when on the sixth day when he finished everything and he said, it is very good. He didn't say good. He said it was very good. And I thought about that. I was like, Father, even from the beginning, you said I was very good. I was complete. And I remember how I used to complain about the size of my feet or uh, the, the my skinniness or my long fingers or different things I would complain about over the years. And I realized, I said, Father, forgive me for that. That's vain. That's vain. You said when you finished on the sixth day, it was very good. And that was everything up until this day and beyond that was completed. And it was very good. So I'm, I just give honor and praise to Father for showing me the error of my way. And I repented and I'm thankful that he loves me so much that he chastised me in such a loving way. So praise y'all. Hallelujah. I yield. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sakin Yaikwa, the floor is yours. Uh, Toda, Shabbat Shalom, Mishpaka. I just want to give all praise, honor, esteem, and Toda Rabah to the Most High. Um, this week, I had um, all my brothers and sisters, most, you know, everybody lives in Cincinnati. And uh, we've been planning like a, a just a nucleus family reunion. Uh, and, it, and it came together, all praises to the Most High. And I, I just thank him for, for, for delivering everybody here safely, kept us safe while we were there. Some of, you know, we went out to the beach with all the Yaladim, young Yaladim at the beach and, and, and everybody was safe. Um, and all the traveling with all the many cars. Um, and, and he just, he protected all of us, you know, and, and we had a, like a, a, a family uh, barbecue um, and, and everybody was fed and everybody was, was happy and all of that. And, and, and we came together um, and it had been a long, long, long time since uh, we came together other than for like a tragedy, like a passing in the family or something like that, or a wedding. So, so I just want to give the most high all praise, honor and esteem. I've gotten um, all the, the, the travel reports back that everybody's back home safe. And, and um, I, I just want to give the most high all the, Thanks, Toda Reba Abba, and all the praise, honor, and esteem that 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 he looks out for his people. Um, Aye, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All praise to the Most High. If no one else has any other praise reports, we'll go ahead and get started in uh, Bereshith or Genesis, chapter fourteen. Bear she for Genesis chapter 14. And it reads, and it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, and Chador Leomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Berak, king of Sodom, and with Bershah, king of Gomorrah, and Shinab, king of Adma, and Shimaber, king of Zobin, Zoboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. All these were joined together in the valley of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Shador Leomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year came Shador Leomer, and the kings that were with him and smote the Rephaims and Ashtoreth, Karnaim, and the Zuzims and Ham, and the Emims and Shaveh Kirathim, 
and the Horites and their Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And they returned and came to Anipshpat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the countries of the Amalekites and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazan Tamar, Hazazan Tamar. And they went out the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Admar and the king of Zeboim and the king of Bela, the same as Zor. And they joined battle with them in the valley of Siddam. With Chador Leomir, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariot, king of El Elisar, four kings with five. And the valley of Siddam was full of slime pits. And the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there. And they that remained fled to the mountain. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. And they took Lot Abram's brother's son who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, the brother of Anir, and these were confederate with Abraham. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chador and Leomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shaveh, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine and he was the priest of the Most High Lehen. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High Lehen, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High Lehen, who have delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave, them, he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, give me, the, give me the persons and take goods to yourself. And Abram said unto the king of Sodom, I lift up my eyes unto Yah, the Most High Lehen, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take from a thread even to the shoe latch, to, the, to a shoe latchet, that I would not take anything that is yours, lest you should say I have made Abram rich. Save only that which the young men have eaten and the portion of the men that are with me, Anair, Eshcol, Mamre, let them take their portion. I guess we can go ahead, uh, we'll go ahead and read 15 as well. Uh, Bereshith of Genesis chapter 15. Bereshith or Genesis chapter 15. After these things, the word of Yah came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I'm your shield and your exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Adonai Yahu, what will you give me, saying I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me you have given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of Yah came to me, saying, This shall not be your heir, but he that shall come forth out of your own bowels shall be your heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if you be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall your seed be. And he believed in Yah, and he counted to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am Yah that brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Adonai Yahuwah, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another. But the birds he divided not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. 
And lo, a great horror of darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that your seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. And you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come here again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day, Yah made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto your seed have I given this land. From the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Rephaims, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. All right, so Bereshev chapter 14, does anyone see anything in any of these two chapters? Start with verse four, uh, chapter 14. Starting with the uh, uh, Zaki and Yaakov, you got something? Uh, I, I'll yield to uh, Adon Shashmar. Okay, Shashmar. Can you hear me? Can I hear you? Yeah, the part that I found interesting was the part where Abram, you know, he took uh, 318 of his servants, you know, to uh, get his, uh, his nephew back, get his nephew Lot back. And I was thinking, you know, it takes a lot of leadership, you know, a lot of uh, wisdom to lead, you know, 318 men, you know, to fight, you know. So I always find that interesting, you know. Uh, you know, the most high is definitely with him. So, you know, he definitely has, you know, leadership qualities. He also has, you know, wisdom. And those men, you know, respected him. They trusted him, you know, to follow his commands and do what he commanded them to do. Are you? Okay, okay. Is that Ken Yaakov? I don't know. Overall, for, for this chapter 14, the, the, the things that jump out to me was, um, you know, Lot was now in, in, in this area um, when, when these kings decided uh, they needed to go to war, you know, and, and it just so happened that Lot was caught up in the middle of all of that, you know, um, you know what? What was the? Because remember, last last uh, Shabbat Eve study, we were talking about how Lot uh, looked over and saw the best part of the land, and he decided to go into that best part of the land with his cattle and his herdsmen. You know, and and some were like, um, some looked at that as a negative, and some of them looked at it. Some of us looked at it as, um, you know, that was just he offered up whatever Lot wanted, and Lot got it. So to me, I'm just seeing that there's. Um, consequences in, in every choice that we make, you know? Um, it wasn't like they were coming against Lot, but Lot was just caught up in, in, in that battle. And then like um, um, Akisha Shamar was saying, um, how, uh, losing that chain of thought real quick, but, but how, um, anyway, that, that um, Abraham, servants he he gathered together his servants that he trained <laughs> and look at how many of those servants that they say was born in his house that he trained you know um like he said the leadership and not only that that leadership too but that trust that trust in their leader you know they that they, they were well trained they were well taken care of you know he built them up and then he went to battle with these uh with these kings to to rescue his nephew you know uh and then, uh, like I said, overall, chapter 14, and then how um, that king of Sodom was like, hey, you know, uh, how Abraham was, look, I'm not going to take nothing from you to give you any room to say that the reason why I did, why I uh, uh, was victorious was because of what you did. And, and, and uh, just to make plain and clear that it wasn't because of you, the most high delivered uh, 
this victory to us. So those are the things that just stuck out in 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 fourteen to me. Ah, uh, Ali, Sean. Along with those things, I also noted that they identified um, Abraham as a Hebrew. I thought that was very interesting that they named him, I mean, his heritage of who he was. And also how the, uh, the king of, um, of Sodom came out to meet them. He came out to meet him. He said he literally came out to meet him and bought bread and wine for them, which was symbolic of the, the um, Messiah, his body and his blood. So I thought that was interesting. I yield. Yeah, it's all points. So when we look at Bereshit, uh, Genesis 14, verse, uh, verse 13. And there came one that escaped and told Avram Hebrew for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre the Amorite, the brother of Eshcol, the brother of Aner. And these were confederate with Abram. So as Ima just mentioned, Abram being a Hebrew, but some of his trained servants were not Hebrews and he still had dealings with them even when it came to going to war. So he had allies, which are not Hebrews that he went to war with. Verse 14, and when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. So as Shashmar was saying about the 318 men, um, it, note, it says here that Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, but then earlier it says his brother's son. So he still looked at Lot as his brother, even though that was his brother's son. That's how the Hebrew family structure was normally dealing. The brother's son would still be looked at like, a, like it was his own brother. And verse 16, and he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Jador Leomer and the kings that were with him at the valley of Shaveh, which is the king's dale. Verse 18, and the Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High Elohim. And he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram of the Most High Elohim, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High Elohim, which, which have delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave them tithe of all. And to the king of Sodom, he said unto Abram, give me the persons and take goods to yourself. And Abram, the king of the Abram said unto the king of Sodom, I've looked up my hand unto Yah. The most high the possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread even to a shoe latch, that I would not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. Say that only which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men that were with me, a near Eshkol and Mamre, let them take their portion. So we see Abraham was very righteous in his dealings with how he dealt with uh, other, even other kings how he didn't take anything that didn't belong to him, except which the young man have eaten. Uh, Rose, you have your hand up? Yeah, Shabbat Shalom, Ms. Baha. Um, I have a question. So verse 18, um, where it, it refers to Melchizedek, why is Messiah compared to him? Or it said in the New Testament that he's that. Okay, good question. Uh, Zakin, you got something on that before we uh, first? Kind. Um, um, when we look at, at Melchizedek, right, it's, it's, when it's broken down into the Hebrew, it's, it's Melech King uh, Zadok, which is, which is uh, righteous. So King Righteous of Salem. And Salem is, uh, is like the short for really Jerusalem. Um, and, and so what it's saying is 
the comparison between Mashiach and Melchizedek is Melchizedek is not a Levite. He's a king and he's a priest unto the most high. And if we look at, at Mashiach, Mashiach is from the tribe of Judah. He's not a Levite. He's not a Levitical priest, but he is the priest of the most high. And so that's where we kind of get that comparison uh, when, when the scripture says that, that Mashiach is, is like unto Melchizedek. He's, he's a king and a priest. And, you know, um, uh, the most high set apart Levites during the Levitical priesthood. And I don't want to go too deep into it. Um, that's probably a lesson for another time. But when the, when the veil was split uh, in two, then the Levitical priesthood, that was the end of the Levitical priesthood. And now we're under the, 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 the kingly priesthood um, as far as teachings, as far as, as doctrine, as, as uh, Mashiach is compared to Melchizedek as a king and a priest unto the Most High instead of the, Le the, the Levites being the priests, uh, the teachers of the Most High. I hope that answers the question. Um, I would just add that, you know, uh, just read Hebrews chapter seven for what Zakay was just talking about, about the Melchizedek being compared to the Messiah. Hebrews chapter seven. Um, does anyone else has any points on Bereshit for Genesis chapter 14 before we move on to 15? Slick, uh, uh, oh, okay. I, I just think that that it, it's it's uh, important to point out um, nineteen and twenty. You know how how uh, Melchizedek professed, you know, um, um, that the Most High blessed Abraham. It was the, was the Most High who did this delivering. You know, um, and as the king, you know, we see that the king of Sodom is there also. And so he's like, you know, uh, kind of like what Abram said in 21 through 24, that lo, this is the, the most high has, has, has um, delivered um, Lot out of the hand of, of those kings, um, not, not Abram himself. And it definitely wasn't uh, the king of Sodom that had any part in that. So I, I think that's, uh, that's key uh, to this story, and, and I'm not trying to take over your lesson, but um, um, 19 and 20 is very key that we see this Melchizedek, the king of Salem, professing in front of uh, the king of Sodom that the most high Elohim done all of this delivering for Abram and Lot. Okay, okay, hallelujah. Um, I think bro, was bro G first? I think bro G was first. Shalom, shalom. Hey Shalom. Um, based upon our responses and 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 um and what I just gathered, and it just made me think about, you know, um the way the way Lot was, the way Lot was captured, that we gotta really like stay away from sin because it'll it'll eventually overtake us if if we if we plan with sin a lot. But that's 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 what that story just made me think about. How you? Gang, gang, to a point. Akoti Rose, floor is yours. Yeah, just kind of to piggyback off what Ima Shoshana said earlier um, with verse 18, it's just, I just like stood out to me even more now that it was Melchizedek who brought the wine and the bread. So it just kind of reminded me of what Ima Shoshana said as the you know, representation of the Mashiach, that it was him that was brought to do that. I yield. Okay. Sis Jen, floor is yours. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Um, everybody already pulled the important things I was already looking at. So um, praise y'all that um, our, our thoughts are kind of in one accord. But I also just wanted to point out, it's just a, a small little um, point, but um, 
Mamre, if if you look on the on the maps, that's near Hebron, which was um, also in the same area, like a little close to the Dead Sea, um, like in that region. So in the region of uh, what we would consider the tribe of Judah. So that's Southern Israel. And it says that they actually chased them all the way up to Dan um, on opposite end of Damascus. So if y'all look, that's all the way up in Northern Israel. I don't know how in the world all of these men ran there. Um, um, praise y'all, I was allowed to go to Israel and it took us a long time to just drive that distance. And in vehicles, we were going probably a little too fast. <laughs> so we were going a certain speed just trying to uh, drive it from where um, it, the Southern Israel, where um, um, Hebron uh, Mamre would have been, or, or mod, um, I would say ancient Hebron and um, Mamre were, all the way up to Northern Israel. Um, that That's a long distance. And, and you know, like just because, you know, I was um, blessed to be able to be in the land and see how far of a distance that is, I can't imagine how long that took on foot. So that just um, that just spoke to me like the 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 training that was already mentioned um, earlier, the training that these men had and the endurance they had, and also the um, it's like Yah truly blessed them, I believe, and because of Abram or Abraham, it I, it just it was just amazing to me the the amount of distance that they covered in or while fighting. So I yield. Told off for the geography. Uh, Zachary Yakwa. Uh, Salika Adon, I, I just want to, I, I want to bring out a, a, another point, uh, if if you don't mind, about uh, uh, Melchizedek, uh, the king. Okay, okay. Um, you know, and 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 uh, Akoti Rose was asking what was the similarities and stuff like that between Mashiach and 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 Melchizedek. You know, and and if we can. You know, like it says, he brought forth the bread and the wine, you know, and then he professed the most high. You know what I mean? And so if, if we think about Mashiach also, you know, um, he said, take this bread and remember, you know, the, 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 symbol, the symbolism of the bread and the wine of Mashiach, you know. And so um, I, I just wanted to kind of highlight those things right there, because, uh, you know, really, that, that's that's that's. Uh, like a Koti Rose was saying, what's the, the similarities and all of that of, of Mashiach and Melchizedek? But you know, just take note of that too, that 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 Melchizedek brought forth the bread and the wine, and then he professed in front of you know everybody that was there, um, the most high. So I, I just wanted to kind of bring that point out also. Okay. Uh, also, uh, one point I forgot to mention was uh, verse 20, um, where it says, Bless and blessed be the most Elohim, which I've delivered your enemies into your hand, and he gave him tithes of all. So that word for tithes is uh, Maaser, which is the tenth. So I believe this is the first mention of giving of tithes in the entire Bible. So he gave a tenth of all that he had. Just to want to bring that point out. Um, does anyone have any, any other points in chapter 14 before we move to chapter 15? Bait Francis. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Can you hear me? Can. Okay. Uh, first, I want to give praise, honor, and esteem to the Most High Yah and acknowledge my each as my covering. Um, something both of, uh, 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 well, all three, my Ab, Yaikwab, um, Sis Rose, and you, Hanakia, was saying about um, uh, Melchizedek and the similarities. When you mentioned that uh, he gave a tent, um, and, and the similarities between uh, Melchizedek and, and Mashiach, when, um, when Mashiach left and he left the Ruach to the, to the church that, and he broke off pieces of the blessings to 
um, to the to the uh, assembly, to the church. That was something that uh, it kind of, I don't know if it's a far off thing, but um, that's what popped into my head when I've been uh, listening to everybody's uh, points about Melchizedek and, and Hamashiach. That's all. Okay, okay, hold up. I'm sorry, can I say something real quick? Yes. I, I just went to read Hebrews 7, as you suggested, and um, it says that Melchizedek was also king of peace. So I just kind of wanted to add that as well. Okay, exactly what um, Zach and Yaakov was saying about king of Salem, uh, which is Shalom, which is king of peace. Okay, okay, told up. All right, I guess we move on to chapter 15. Oh, Ima Shoshana. <laughs> One other thing that it, it brings out about the bread and the wine, it's the first um, uh, act of, uh, of the Mashiach when he offered himself as the bread and the wine, when he, you know, did with the, uh, his emissaries, giving of the bread and the wine and offering himself all throughout the scriptures, it shows of himself giving up of himself. And it was uh, Melchizedek that offered up the, blood, uh, the um, bread and the wine, which is the blood and the body of Yahusha. So it symbolizes the whole picture of himself offering himself and giving himself. I yield. Okay, hallelujah. All right, very sheep, uh, Genesis chapter 15. We just read it. Uh, does anyone have any points in that chapter before I bring out any points in chapter 15? I think we we uh, <laughs> waiting for you to kind of open okay. the door with your comments. <laughs> okay, you okay. All right, uh, verse one, where it says, after these things, the word of Yah came unto Abram in a vision, saying, fear not, Abram, I'm your shield and exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Adonai Yahweh, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And this steward is of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me, you have given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of Yah came unto him, saying, This should not be your heir, but he that shall come forth out of your own bowels shall be your heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, tell the stars, if you be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall your seed be. And he believed in Yah, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So we see here Abraham, at first he thought Eleazar of Damascus would be his, the next in line for the, the, um, the lineage. But the Most High is telling him that he's going to actually have a child, even in his old age, that he was still going to have a child through Sarah, which would be the heir to eventually pass on the covenant towards and Abraham believed and he counted it to righteousness based on his belief. Um, let's look at verse 13. And he said unto Abraham, know of a surety that your seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them. And they shall afflict them 400 years and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. 
and you should go to your fathers in peace and be you should be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come here again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So here we see um, Abram has a dream, or actually a dark dream, a nightmare rather, about the prophecy of the 400 years that they will serve in Egypt. And that the Most High is going to judge that nation. And they're going to come out with great substance, which we know was eventually the Passover. And he's telling Abraham that he's going to he's going to go to his fathers in peace. And in the fourth generation, Israel will eventually be brought back into that same land that Abraham is being told of at this point right here. All right. Verse 18. In the same day, y'all made a covenant with Abraham, saying unto your seed, I've given this land from the river of Egypt. Unto the great river, the, the river Euphrates, the, Ken the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Cabanites, and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaims, and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. So the Most High made a covenant with Abram, telling him that this is going to be the land which you and your descendants, which, be, which shall be numbered as the stars of the sky, which means there's going to be so many that you can't count. This is the land that is being promised right now to Abraham, which is the same and his descendants will dwell in, the promised land. Um, does anyone else have any other points in this chapter? All right, Francis. Shalom. Yes, yeah, so in um, verse, oh, where was it? Seven where he says, I am uh, Yah that brought you, brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees um, to give to you. I like how Yah always um, shows us that he's delivering us from um, a land that is not good for us as a way to introduce himself. So I'm the one who bought you out of Ur, Chaldees. We know I'm the one that bought you out of Mitzrayim. And so that's, um, I, I just noticed that as, as we were reading, but I think that's a, because uh, he, he humbles us all before he delivers us so that we know that it's him that's delivering us and how amazing and awesome he is. So um, I just noticed that uh, that was cool for me. Okay, so that. Shoshana. Uh, praise Yah. Um, I noticed first of all that um, Yah said that he was Abram's shield and his exceeding reward. I mean, to be told that he is your shield, that, that's, that's awesome in itself. And that uh, the other thing was that his faith was counted as righteousness. And um, other point that someone already made about his seed coming from um, his heir coming from his seed and the offering that was made unto uh, Yah, how um, Abram protected it, make sure no birds would get any animal or anything got to that offering, how he protected that offering up to the father. That's what I have so far. I yield. Okay. So I robot. Oh, so, so Lee, God, whose hand was it? Uh, I accidentally pushed the wrong button. That was mine. I don't. Uh, um, okay. I, I I just wanted to kind of bring out too that that you know we're seeing in verse one where it says after these after after these things the word of the most of the word the word of Yah came unto Abram in a vision saying fear not, Abram and and I mean we we kind of see you know, in a little bit later on in this chapter, what Abraham might have been afraid of, you know, but I, I just, like, like uh, Ima Shoshana said that, that uh, you know, uh, and uh, 
my but uh Kiera was saying how um the most high how the most high kind of reveals himself and um the 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 grace and the mercy and the love um of the of the most high towards um his people you know um and that the most high is going to be his shield and his great reward like like Imam Shoshana said you know um but that right there I don't I don't want to get too 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 deep into to what Abraham might have been afraid of that the most high came in a vision to told him not to be afraid of you know and and we can we can like I said we can see it a little bit later but I think that is um kind of like what Imam Shoshana was alluding to well, what she said was you know that the most high is our shield you know to remind Abram that that the most high that he, hey, I got you. I, you know, don't worry about too much of anything. I got you. You know, and and I'm gonna be your great reward. And like the point you was bringing out about um, the stars, um, the one, the other thing too is, and, and I don't remember if if you made that a highlighted point. So so I don't know, but you know how. Um, and we see later on in the Kings and all of that stuff too, how, I don't know, I'm going to put it this way. When I, when I was coming up, um, it was like, don't you dare question the most high. It is what it is. That's his will. Don't you dare question him. But you know, Abram is like, well, how, how what's going to, how can I know that, that, that um, what you're promising me, not, not only first is going to come to pass, but how will I know that this is when it happens, how will I know that, that it is happening <laughs> you know what i mean what is what is going to be the sign to be that that you you're fulfilling your promise you know instead of just saying well the most high said he's going to he's, he's going to give me these things you know and and i'm not telling nobody <laughs> to question the most high but we can see in some instances where it's like i don't want to miss it can you make sure i understand that it's it, that it's you and and that i should walk in that way because you said you know, not 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 question the most high. Like you know, I hope you're getting the point. But but we see how, in the, especially King David too, uh, we saw we see later on. But I just want to make that that kind of highlight that point too. That it's, I think Abram is actually he's not questioning the most high. I think he's just asking the most high. Can you make sure it's plain and clear when it happens <laughs> that this is what I'm supposed to do? I yield. Hey, hey, Torah. Uh, Colty Rose, floor is yours. Yes. So, it, um, I'm sorry, I don't know the accent we just spoke, but he kind of touched on the point that I was going to make is like for me, what I found very beautiful is how detailed the Most High was with in his promises. Um, like, um, our Colty Francis said earlier, um, I think it was verse seven. He says, I am um, Yah that brought you out of Ur, it, of the Chaldees. But then he says, to give you this land to inherit it. So you like, once you walk into this inheritance, it's not coming from anybody else, but from me. And then when he goes down to verse, um, when he talks about the fourth generation, like he didn't just tell him the good stuff, the fling good stuff, but he let him know, hey, they're going to get captured. And in the fourth generation or 14th, I don't remember what it says, is going to come back into captivity for this purpose. So I feel like that was a point, that was the thing that he gave him to hold on to so that when they are in captivity, that he doesn't lose heart, that he knows, he remembers the purpose of what is going on and that he can pass that down to his children so that they too can take heart to know that this is the will of the most high and this is why. You know, so he didn't leave it anything in the dark. Like he says, you know, I won't withhold any good things for my children. He let him know up front, not only am I going to bless you, but this is what's going to happen with the blessing that I'm going to give you. I yield. Okay, hallelujah. Told out for that. Uh, Shah Shamar. Okay, and I just wanted to uh, land back of what Emo Shoshana said earlier. Uh, your sound went out if you're speaking, Shashamar. Can you 
right now. Can I? Yeah, I was uh, focusing on uh, Bereshit, uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, where the Most High said, Fear not, Abraham, I'm that shield and that exceeding reward. And it made me think about um, Ephesians chapter 6, uh, where it talks about you know, the whole armor of Elohim, the whole armor of God. And in verse, verse 16, it says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So yeah, I just made that comparison. So now I see that scripture a lot differently now in um, Ephesians, you know, when it's the shield of faith, you know, it says above all, the shield of faith. So above all, the most high, you know, I yield. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah. Um, Imarji, did you have something? Oh, your microphone was open. No, I'm sorry. I was moving my phone. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. I guess we can read um, chapter 16. Bear sheep for Genesis chapter 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had in handmaid an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold, now Yah have restrained me from bearing. I pray you, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said unto Abram, my wrong be upon you. I have given my maid into your bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. Yah judge between me and you. But Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as it pleaseth you. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of Yah found her by the fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way of shore. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, from whence came you? And where will you go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of Yah said unto her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hands. And the angel of Yah said unto her, I will multiply your seed exceedingly, that it should not be numbered for a multitude. And the angel of Yah said unto her, behold, you are with child and you shall bear a son and shall call his name Ishmael, because Yah have heard your affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of Yah that spake unto her. You Elohim seest me. For she said, have I also here looked after him that seeth me. Wherefore the well was called Be'er Lahai Roy. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bare Abram a son. And Abram called his son's name which Hagar bare Ishmael. And Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. So with in verse in chapter 16, we see her Sarai is, um, still hasn't had any sons yet. And she gives Hagar to Abraham. And then when you see that Hagar actually conceived, we see Sarai and Abraham kind of getting into it a little bit. And then she gets into it with, with Hagar. Uh, verse five, uh, well, verse, verse four. And he went up to Hagar and she conceived. 
And when she bare, when she saw that she had conceived her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said unto Abram, my wrong be upon you. I have given my maid unto your bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. Y'all judge between me and you. Uh, what do y'all think about that? About the dispute between Sarai, Abram, and Hagar. Imanu Kurt. It reminded me going back to Adam and Eve um, when you start blaming each other for their wrong. So that's what I see in that. That um, she's blaming um, her husband, and her husband blaming her. Going back to the beginning. Oh, yeah. I am. Told out for that, Ima. Wait, Francis. Uh, that was, um, well, uh, and four at the end, it says that her mistress was despised in her eyes. But when she went to um, Abram, she said that her mistress despised her. So she kind of flipped it a little bit. Um, I mean, According to the Genesis, uh, according, yes, that's what I'm going to say. Gang, <laughs> gang, throw it out. And these are righteous people, by the way. These are, these are our forefathers, our righteous forefathers. Keep that in mind. Um, Rose, the floor is yours. So for me, instantly, it reminded me of the um, Elkanah and Hannah story because um, kind of the same thing happened with them. And I see like the big difference between Hannah and Sarai. Instead of going to um, Elkanah, you know, Hannah went to the Most High herself. Like she cried out to the Most High. But with Sarai, she's like you, you, everyone's saying she's doing the blame game. But I think that the way Abraham handled it, I may be wrong, but I feel like he handled it with wisdom because one, it was Sarai who gave him Hagar. And then he says, well, since you gave her to me, deal with it the way that you see fit. And we saw that later on that the most high backed him up with what he said by saying, deal with her the way that you see fit. And then when he want to turn around and well, I don't want to get of uh, go ahead, but when he wanted to like back away, the most high said, no, hearken to the voice of your wife because you did it before. So, you know, and like this time is going to bring back order. So that's kind of like what I got from it. I yield. Hey, how you So I can back up. I'll yield to Imam Shoshana. Okay, Imam Shoshana. Shalom. Um, you almost made me forget my thought. <laughs> I just knew you were going to do that. <laughs> um, what did I? Oh, my goodness. My thought went from my head just that quick. Um, oh, yeah. How uh, Sarah was leaning to her own understanding. What happens when we lean to our own understanding about how things are supposed to proceed or process or come about and we step ahead we try to get ahead of Yah or help Yah out which he don't need our help and all these circumstances fall into place behind it because of our doing it's like a domino effect because we started something that we thought was right ended up wrong but Y'all always turns everything around for the good. Praise y'all for that. I yield. How are y'all? Am I Audrey? I wanted to bring out another point. Whenever I read this, I always um, think about Adam and Eve. Now, y'all just told Adam, I'm sorry, y'all just told Abram that he would have a son and would come from his bowels and that Sarah would bear the child. And when Sarah tells him to go into Hagar, perhaps 
she would be the one that's supposed to have the child. Abram, I guess, discards that, or even he, maybe perhaps doubt has set in his mind because it hasn't happened yet, or what have you. But it's the same thing with uh, Adam and Eve. Adam was given the instruction. However, when Eve enticed him, he quickly forgot the instructions that, uh, uh, that um, Yah had given him. So I see the same thing here as I saw with Adam and Eve. Hey, hold it up. Oh, Bait Francis. Floor is yours. Shalom, everyone. Um, um, the, the thing, question I had is about um, Abraham. Every every time he had to make something uh, unimportant, he asked most high for guidance. And uh, on this instance, he did not ask because if it was meant for the handmaid to give him a give him a child, he should have asked most high. Hey, this it because most has specifically told him, hey, it's going to come from Sarai. So I, I don't know why he didn't refer back to the most high and ask for guidance. Okay, that's a that's a very interesting point. I I actually never thought about it from that from that perspective. But let's um look at verse um seven. An angel of Yah found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way of shore to shore, and he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from, and where will you go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of Yah said unto her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hands. And the angel of Yah said unto her, I will multiply your seed exceedingly, that it should not be multitude, numbered for multitude. And the angel of Yah said unto her, you, shall, you are with child and shall bear a son and shall call his name Ishmael, because Yah have heard your affliction. So we see here, even though uh, they may have supposedly jumped the gun, but it's still Abraham's son. So it still makes Abraham the father of many nations, just not the promised son. And Ishmael here, we see he, he's also getting blessings because he's Abraham's son, but he's just not the seed of the promise. Um, does anyone else have any other points on uh, Zach and Yaqua? Uh, um, I, I just want to, I wanted to be sure. I'm, I'm, I'm looking back. I'm, I'm looking back and, I, and at this point, I, I don't, I don't, I don't see that the most high told Abram that it, it was going to be Sarah. I mean, I think we, can somebody point that out if, if they see that? I think at this point, Kane, most Kane, I, just I was going to bring out the same point. Yeah, yeah, because he just said from his own body. Right, right. And so, so that's why he 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 agreed to it. Con, con, because like I said, remember um, when, when Abram questioned, how will I know? You know, but he didn't, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, and then so at this point, I think, just, I think it is an example for us also that that we don't know everything. But like um, um, uh, um, my son Yamin just brought out too that that he didn't seek the Most High. We don't see in Scripture where he went to the Most High and say, "Hey, is it okay? Is is this seed that you promised me going to come from from my handmaid, or should I wait for Sarah, my wife?" He he didn't seek the the the, the, the advice. And just like I think Ima Shoshana pointed out, I don't remember which Ima pointed it out, but it kind of reminds like like uh, um, the Most High told Adam that you hearkened into the voice of your wife, you know. Um, so I don't I don't think at, at this particular point, this one there is the point is coming up where he says, no, I, I'm I'm your seed is going to come through Sarah, but I don't think he knew that at this point. And I think he said, well, the most he knew his wife was barren and has always been barren. So maybe in his mind, maybe this is what the most high is talking about, that, it, that the air is going to come from my seed, but maybe it's going to come from from not my wife. And I think um, and we'll see later on where the most high says, no, 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 no. 
your seed, the seed, the promise seed is going to come from your wife, Sarah, you know, but I don't think at this point he knew it was, uh, he was, he was clear that it was Sarah that was supposed to bear the, the seed of the promise. I yield. Okay, throw it out for that. Zaki. Um, Ima Shoshana, floor is yours. Let me back off of that. I totally agree because it's in verse um, chapter 15 and verse four. He said it will come from your own body. So it is a, a, a fact of them leaning to their own understanding, both Sarah and Abram, because, because it's his seed, rather it's from his Isha or from the handmaiden. He's still looking at it, it's his seed. So when he told Sarah to deal with Hagar the way you see fit. He didn't say nothing about the child. He said her. <laughs> deal with her. That's my seed, but deal with her. <laughs> uh, I yield. Oh, yeah. I have a question. Um, okay. It says that, verse 12, and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. Um, what 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 do you what do you think that means? Jackie, did you want to answer that before I uh, give it a shot? Um, Tom, you you can give it a shot first. Um, Ado. Well, basically, what I from what I'm looking at is. It's describing the nation of the na the nature of Ishmael, which is he's a wild by nature, which means that he's going to be always. Well, when we read later on in the story, we read about how him and Isaac got into it, but I don't want to jump ahead of the story. But Isaac, by nature, was very wild, and it said that his hand would be against every man, and every man's hand against him. So I don't know the exact origin of that statement, but I know that Ishmael was even as a child was always very kind of had violent tendencies towards Isaac. And that's part of the reason why he got kicked out as well. Um, Zach and Yaqua, floor is yours, you want to respond. Yeah, and and um, I don't want to go into the, the Hebrew and all of that, but when we look at like the wild man and, and really what it's trying, I think what it's expressing is that he's, he's uh, sort of unbridled, like like uh, impulsive. And, and that's going to offend a lot of people. So he's going to be um, offending a lot of people just by his nature, like, like uh, Adon Kanaki, I just said, which is going to cause a lot of conflict throughout um, his life, you know? And, and, and we know that, that uh, a lot of times it's, it's, it's like father, like son, like, like, um, mother like daughter so so his kind of characteristics is probably going to be well i don't want to say probably because like like a don't knock i said we're going to see later on how this um uh manifest this wild man but really it's, it's really talking about he's kind of like unbridled i think uh um he's just not not he's not worried about if he offends anybody it's just his his uh his demeanor and his nature is 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 uh, unbridled. I'm I'm and not really uh, empathetic or sympathetic or or conscientious. He's just like a, I think some some translations I think say even like like a wild donkey. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just kind of um, and you'd have to be you know the the, the cultural aspect of how they, how donkeys. I, I kind of there was I remember when I was a child, man, and and and. In my in my grandmother's neighborhood, there was people. There was a guy that had a donkey, and every now and then that donkey would get out, and the whole neighborhood was uh, was on caution. <laughs> Everybody's trying to grab their kids and make sure they bring their kids inside, and until they caught that donkey. So um, I think that's what it's talking about. Um. So would you say that it's um? it's kind of of a punishment because of the way that he was conceived out of order, I guess, or out of not being the promised seed. I think, um, I, I, let me, let me answer it this way. I, I think it's, 
it's the purpose of the Most High's plan, because we see how how Ishmael Ishmael's descendants um, really has an impact on 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 the way Israel um, Israel's history is 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 unfolded. You know, so I, I think it's whether you can see it as a punishment to Ishmael. I, I don't I don't know if I would see it that way, but I think it's it's purposeful um, for the Most High's uh, plan, especially towards towards Israel, and 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 you know, as we go later on through the studies, we'll see how how Ishmael's descendants kind of played a a lot of of role in the way Israel's history unfolded. Kind of like, um, well, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but that's, I don't know if I would call it a punishment. I, that, you could see it as a punishment, but I don't, I, don't, um, I don't know if I would necessarily call it a punishment. I hope that's, that kind of answers it. Shabbat shalom, shabbat shalom, shabbat shalom, Ms. Bakar. Y'all are having an intense conversation over here. Hallelujah. Um, uh, I agree with Zakane. That's a very good question, my sister. Um, it wasn't a punishment. Um, and when we're reading the Torah, um, one of the things that we have to look at, and, and I'm going to go on some points that y'all already discussed in just a moment. But when we read in the Torah, we need to see every aspect that's there because some of it's, it's past tense, meaning it happened to the forefathers before. And then some of it's also present tense, like our behaviors. And so when we go to the word, we should be able to see our behaviors good and bad also written in the scripture. And I'm explaining what I mean by that. So everyone, um, as we've been covering from the beginning of Bereshit, we started when he created marriage and then he told him to be fruitful and multiply. So everything was about bringing forth families through husband and wife and they have children, their children, children have children, so on and so forth. So we covered the word tola dot or tola, tola da, which is gonna be generation or generations in plural. Um, and then we seen from just the picture or the pattern of the Torah, how it started now defining each generation. And it started off with Yefeth and Ham, and then it came to Israel focusing on the lineage because that's gonna be very important. And it's a very focal point about family. When we read about Adam and Eve, we read about Cain and Abel. So it's still siblings. So it's gonna be somewhat of the natural thing that happens within sibling rivalries. One thing you're gonna see with Ishmael is Ishmael was the oldest. So generally, according to Torah, the oldest will be the one that will receive the blessing or double portion of the blessing of the father. He is the inheritor of the father in normal situations of, according to the way a person is born and the law of the firstborn. But because that was not the promised seed that the most I was talking about, he's going to lose that birthright. I mean, his mother is going to go and live someplace else for a time. So whatever. Uh, so when he said, I seen your misery, you know, so the most I seen her misery. So as mothers tend to do and fathers tend to do, families tend to do. Sometimes when we talk around our children, the things we say or we feel, we interject onto the children. Mm -hmm. So as they grow up, those things are still in them and they become angry, they become upset and they become, and as I can't say it the clean way, if you look, I'm going to in the dictionary, um, cause it's, and I know a lot of times we try to clean it up, but we're just going to say it and we're going to say it, it called them a uh, parade, uh, parade, which in the dictionary says wild ass. Now, ass is just another, another word for donkey. So children that are listening in don't think we're cursing. It's the way the world used that word to make it derogatory. But uh, ass is just simply a donkey. So it said he will be a wild ass. That's what it called him. So the childhood experiences, the not having the birthright, he was already jealous of his little brother because he already understood certain things that was gonna take place. So that's just in the sense of family. And we've seen with uh, Cain and Abel, the jealousy between brothers. We've seen David's, uh, King David's children and the pattern of how sometimes someone gets jealous. So it's just the nature of what goes on in family sometimes. That's just in understanding what we see in Torah. So if we see any attributes within ourselves, we need to work on those. Now, another thing is, as I can say, it's also just gonna be maybe part of Yah's purpose or function. So they were still blessed. There's 12 tribes of Israel. He said there were gonna be 12 princes of Ishmael. So he didn't even give them really any less blessings. They were blessed also. But the thing about it was they did not the ones that received the birthright and the blessings of the Most High. 
Um, so another thing, when we're going to some of this historical, and we're going to have to uh, focus on some genealogies. One thing that I, I would say in the text, um, there are a lot of nations that already know who they are according to biblical Torah text. The one that's most unidentified, and that's purposely, is Israel. Israel is the one that's been whitewashed, it's been blotted out, it's been lost, no one wants to accept who they really are. That's been by design. But there are some nations that can tell you right now from a very long time ago who they are according to the text. And Ishmael already has an identity and they consider themselves Ishmaelites and they know that a lot of them already in the land. So the Ishmaelites are commonly, what's commonly called, um, uh, and I know some people take offense and I mean no offense if I'm pronouncing it wrong, but uh, some will say Arab or some say Arab. Arabic. Uh, so those people in the land are considered who Ishmael are. So when you look at the tendencies that they have, their country has been wild. Um, war is nothing new to them because that's internal fighting within the country. They fight against other countries and the, uh, some of their beliefs, and I'm not trying to say all of them are terrorists, but just the way that some of their nation moves you know, they will strap a bomb on and, and, and handle that business, you know? So their mannerisms is based on war, based on wow, based upon anger, you know, that's customarily or in their nature, who they are. And some of that stuff starts from a very long time ago from ancient times. So that's just to get into that, which we get into some of that stuff a little bit more in a more detailed uh, genealogy study. But since you asked that question, so it's not a curse that's placed upon them because the most high blessed them. It's the 12 tribes of Israel. It was 12 princes of Ishmael. And they were wealthy. They had, they had it going on. You know what I'm saying? So it wasn't like they had any less than Israel had. They still were blessed. And they were 12 princes. So that wasn't a curse. That was their, their uh, behavior, their conduct, their, um, uh, like a better word, I'm losing the word I was trying to say. Well, that's their mannerism. Their, their mannerism is going to be wild, not by curse, but by uh, uh, experiences of childhood, growing up, um, jealousy, just the different things of not actually having the birth of mine. Um, helped a little bit, my sister. Um, I want to back up to um, another good point. And I like the way that y'all actually navigated through the word and started filling in certain things. So um, we see that actually when you go back to chapter 15, it said that the seed your heir is going to be of your seed, of your loins. So it let him know at that particular time, you're going to have a seed of your loins. So again, I know there's uh, the thing, and, and I hate to go into all these topics, but just for the sake of bringing all things together. So we have what we have in the Jewish nations now where, um, and when I say Jewish, I'm not talking about the Hebrew Israelite culture. I'm just talking for a person to claim that they are Jewish. They base it upon their mother. And if your mother's a Jew, then that makes you a Jew or you're Jewish. Well, I guess that's fine for religion, but this is genealogy and it's not religion. Jewish is a religion and it's not the nation of Israel. So when people think that you are what your mother is, and there's even people in our community that believe the same thing, when you just read the context of the text, the seed is going to come of your loins. The seed comes forth from the man. Therefore, whatever the father is, that is the nation that the child will be. That's why in the Torah, it's also written that a Hebrew woman was supposed to marry a Hebrew man specifically of her tribe for the sake of inheritance. Because if you marry to another tribe, or if you marry to another nation, the inheritance that belongs to your father will not go to another tribe or another nation. Therefore, if the child is a Judah and the father is Judah and the mother is Ishakar, the child has not become an uh, Ishakarite. He's still a Judite because the child is what the father is. So the seed comes forth from the man. Therefore, the tribe is based upon the lineage of the father. So the child is whatever the father is for as the nationality is considered. And I know we say half this, half that, but he is whatever actually the father is. So if the mother is a Hebrew and the father is a Gentile, the child is still a Gentile. If the father is a Hebrew and the mother is a Gentile, then the child is a Hebrew. So that's just the text, the Torah, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So going back to the conversation y'all were just having, so he was told that. And the thing is now in the natural, there's things that we don't always 
understand fully from the Most High. And as uh, Yamin was saying, as Zakain Yaquab was saying, in most instances, you see where Abraham, as well as Moshe, except for some times when they might have missed the mark, they would always ask the Most High. But whenever they move without asking the Most High, sometimes things took on a different dynamic than what the Most High had planned. But the Most High still blessed them. It just, they had to, you know, Moses didn't make it into the promised land because that one time he did not put Yah's name on it and he got in his emotion. So as Yamin was uh, bringing out, most of the time, Abraham would ask the Most High, but this particular time he listened to his wife. It's absolutely nothing wrong with listening to your wife. But if your wife is outside of the plan of Yah, that can be an issue. So he listened to his um, he listened to his wife in regards to um, him having a son, but it's not even that the wife is being negative. So a lot of times when we look at this at a, when we are reading it and, oh, she did it, she did that. Yeah, we can have this discussion in, in full to bring out all the points. She wasn't even doing anything negative. We sometimes cannot even process the greatness of what Yah can do. We don't understand how it's going to work. He said this. We don't even know how that's going to work. I can't have a child. I'm old now. You got to think of her mindset. But she understands that she's a helpmate. And we see how submissive she was to him because she called him Adoni or my master or Adon master. So she was very submissive. So in no way was she actually a negative Isha. She was positive. And now what she's doing is trying to be a help. I'm trying to assist my Ish in the purpose and the function that the Most High has for him because he's going to bring forth a mighty nation through the loins of my Ish, but my womb has been dead forever in my youth. Now I am old. So for him to fulfill the purpose that the Most High has for him, I have to figure out how to help him with that and not only figure out how to help him with that, but as a woman, be willing to help him with that. <laughs> do, do, do we see that? What is the willingness? I'm going to have to offer another woman into his bed for him to now be able to fulfill that because in my mind, I'm not considering because the most I didn't tell me he's going to give me a child. He told him he's going to have a child and I never considered, nor did he consider, is it coming through my wife? How's that going to happen? So she was just trying to be a help. Now back to another portion that y'all were discussing. But sometimes being a help, the thing she needed to do as Abraham needed to do was speak to the most high about it, ask for direction and instruction. And also not only going outside of the will of the most high, but also even asking your ish. Sometimes when trying to be a help, women have very good ideals. You're very well thought out and you're very logical, you know? And so sometimes you think things out and you have everything perfectly planned, but sometimes the perfect plan may not be the way Yah wants it done or even your each wants it done because there's another thought that Yah already had thought out or your each already had thought out that you did not calculate for because you don't know that thought yet. So you might get ahead of the plan, not knowing these things. That doesn't mean it's negative. You're just trying to be a help. So what that does is it now tells us that we need to ask more questions before we act. You said this, how does this look? How does it function? And now going back into what Zakane Yaquab said, we have been taught a bad, I'm, I'm going to say it. We've been taught a bad thing in church that you can't talk to God and you can't ask Elohim questions. All of our forefathers did. That's the reason why we're so off today because we don't want to ask the most high. Well, how am I supposed to do this? Well, Elohim, what do you mean? We're supposed to ask, how can I execute something and I don't understand it? And then I can't ask the one who gave me the commandment. I can't ask him, how is it going to work, Father? How are you going to do this? Gideon. Most high, show me this, make, make this wet, make this dry, make it wet again, make it dry one more time. They had to continue to ask the most high because they wanted to be sure of what the most high wanted. We have been taught against everything that the Torah tells us and shows us, instructs us how to have a personal relationship with our father. Back to the context of where we were at. So she just tried to act it out. She got ahead of the most high's plan and she now um, give, giving his wife into his bosom, which Abraham went along with. Now, I want to talk about this other topic. I'm not going into it in detail. I'm going to touch on it briefly. To some of you, it may be new to your ears. To some of you, you've heard it before, but we have to talk about it. According to the Torah, there, a marriage can be uh, 
polygamous, or there can be what we call polygyny, or there can be monogamy. A man, according to Torah, can have more than one wife, according to Torah. That is how Abraham was able to bring forth um, Ishmael. The 12 tribes of Israel came not through one woman, but through uh, four different women, because Jacob had four different women that brought forth the 12 tribes of Israel. So polygyny or multiple wives is written in the Torah or written in the text. So it is lawful, but there are laws that go along with that, which we're not going to go into all that topic tonight. I just want to touch that so I can bring this point out. But when we see it in the text, what we, yeah, we go into that more in the gift study. But when we see it in the text, the way some men, a lot of men, and I'm almost scared to say probably most men that practice it today, because I know a lot of brothers, when they want to come to the Hebrew Israelite walk, they only want to be a Hebrew Israelite because you can have more than one wife. That's not the first thing a brother need to hear about. That don't need, even need to be anything on his mind. Do you even know how to serve the most high yet? You talking about multiple wives? You ain't even fit to be with one woman yet because you don't even know how to serve Yah. What we can see in the text is Abraham did not ask for another wife, nor did he seek another wife. Yaquab or Yaikol or Jacob did not ask for any woman except for Raquel, commonly called Rachel. So the mindset of our forefathers were, they were in love with the woman they were in love with. That's who they wanted. Abraham got another woman because his wife tried to be his help and said for this to be able to happen, for this to, for you to produce this seed of this lineage, then I have to bring another woman in to help you accomplish that. And she was willing to do so, okay? But again, the mindset of Abraham wasn't that he's going out looking for other women. I don't want a whole bunch of wives. That wasn't what he did. That wasn't what Yaakov did. Yaakov or Yaakov, the way he received his first second wife, which actually was his first wife, I call her first second because it's not the one he wanted, was because he was pretty much tricked by his father-in-law, which gave him the oldest daughter first when he only worked for the one that he wanted. And we still see even within that, there was still a little bit of controversy, not controversy, but discomfort for the one that he did not want because he didn't even want her, but he had to keep her. But also what we're going to see is about covenant and responsibility. But the fact that she was his wife, that he did not even want himself, he still took care of her. He still honored his covenant and he never put her away all the days of his life. That was his Isha, his wife. So this Torah gives us a picture of all things, even being in love with someone or not, and how he still loved her according to Torah. So I'm just covering all these bases while we're here. So back to this. Abraham received a second woman, commonly referred to as a concubine by some. It was called, she was called a wife here in this text, was because his wife was willing to help. Now, in order for a man's name to carry on, there's also another law in the Torah that says if a man dies without having a child, then his nearest of kin supposed to live first of all be one of his brothers is supposed to now take his wife that's been put away. And this is going to sound foreign to a lot of us because it is foreign because we wasn't raised up in this culture and in the Torah. So we look at it as if a, if a man is with his brother's wife after the brother passed, we look at that today and we are frown upon it because we like, oh, that's nasty. He's with his brother's wife. Well, yeah, it is nasty if she already if she already has children by him. But if she does not have children by him and he died without child, then his brother was supposed to, according to Torah, and once we get to some of these laws, I'll bring all these points out. I'm giving the fast version tonight. Was supposed to go into her and bring forth a seed, more so specifically trying to bring forth a male seed so that the lineage or the tribe or the name carries on. Because if he does not have a male child, his name does not carry on and his name ended up dying out at that level and that generation now cease. So his Isha was not only just doing things uh, recklessly, she was doing things willingly, submissively, and she put herself in an uncomfortable space to do so. All right. So I just want to paint that whole picture. But now the other part that y'all were talking about. <laughs> um, so then she had an issue once she had a child. And when she had a child, now she felt like 
the handmaid is not disrespecting her. She looks at me different. She don't have the same respect for me. She's mocking me, whatever she was feeling. Or, the, or now she's uncomfortable because she's now giving my Isha a child. I can't give him a child. However she felt about that, then she went to Abraham. But as a Koti Rose and Iman Shoshana had brought out, it's actually different than the Adam and Eve scenario. Adam and Eve was going back and forth with the most high, mm -hmm. making excuses. Mm -hmm. Abraham didn't make an excuse at all. Mm -hmm. He humbly said, hey, whatever. <laughs> it's your handmaid. Hey, whatever you want to do with her, do. You are the one who suggested it. I went along with your suggestion, mm -hmm. and I'm still humbly rolling with what you want to roll with. So it's not even really so much as even an argument here. It's what you want. This is what you wanted, right? I, I, this is how you helped me. I went along with it. Now, if this is how you feel, you are still my Isha. You are the one I love. I understand you're trying to help me. Do as it will make you feel good. Do as it pleases you. Now, in order for us to get the full text, which we can't get tonight, I know a lot of brothers don't like to read the historical writings, but it fills in a lot of the voids of the conversation that he had with his Isha, the conversations that might have been had with the Most High. Some of these things we do need to look at from some of the historical texts, the filling some of the voids and some of the questions that I heard y'all asking tonight. But it does, it does show that he the head as a you, got more, right? you, you cut out on that. We we didn't hear that last uh probably 10 sec, uh probably three, four seconds. Okay. This internet is actually still acting up in here. Okay. What about now, Zakane? Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Okay. Okay. So what was the last thing you heard me say, Zakane, if you can recall? I, you were talking about um uh Slika. I, I I can't remember. I know you were going into um um that slip in my mind, Moray Slika. You were saying, Moray, that um, you might, you might, Isha, do as you see, please, um, as it makes you feel better. Okay, okay. So, yeah, so I was talking about the historical writings, and then I was talking about how um, whatever would make her feel better. So we're showing, we're seeing how he humbled himself to his Isha, also showing that, yes, the man is the head of the house, but we learn how to be the head of the house from the righteous forefathers. It was not this controlling dominating you do what i say as i say hush woman it was not that mannerism that some of our hebrew brothers have the woman just in total you are supposed to be in total subjection to your husband but you understand what i'm saying not the compassionate loving we have a conversation about this we're discussing this how do you feel about this my love this is how you feel okay here's what we're going to do whatever he was still very humble he went along with what she wanted and we know Abraham was a tough cat. We just read him and 300 men went. So he ain't soft at all, but he was still uh, very humble and compassionate to the feelings of his Isha or his wife. And that is who we're supposed to learn from. We're supposed to learn from the righteous forefathers, such as Abraham. He was very concerned with how his Isha felt about the situation. If this is how you feel about it, I did not even lay with her for love. I didn't lay with her for pleasure. I didn't lay with her for any of that. It was for the sole purpose of trying to bring forth this air. You suggested it. I did so. But if she's giving you issues, however you see fit that we should deal with this, so be it, my love. We see him with humility still uh, give in to his Isha and her feelings because that's the woman he wanted. And today, uh, customarily, uh, not customarily, I don't want to say customarily, but very, uh, what makes people frown upon polygyny today are there are brothers who are taking multiple wives, knowing that their Isha they've been with for 10, 20 years is not with it. Then when they take another wife and she already expressed she's not with it, they didn't consider her feelings. And then they say, well, according to Torah, I can take another wife. Then they take this wife. They want to label the woman wicked when she wants to walk away and label her adultery. Or she walked away, so I, I gave her a bill of divorce and I put her away because she's wicked. She wasn't wicked. You wasn't even considering her feelings the way Abraham considered the feelings of his Isha. So what Torah are you reading? There is a way that polygyny is actually done properly according to the text, and Abraham considered the feelings of his Isha. And I just want to go on record that we can see that because some things that we are frowning upon, we shouldn't frown upon because it is Torah. The reason why we are we should frown upon it 
is the way people are misusing and misabusing the words of Torah to actually give into fornication and certain things that some, not all, some are given into. Okay, so I just want to cover that point. And the historical writers, as I say, once we start going into some of those, it'll fill in some of the uh, gaps of some of the questions that was already asked. So um, I want to um, back up real quick and we come back to uh, Abraham in just a moment. But I just want to back up for the sake of, of um, let's go, I'm just going back to 13. So real quick. So when we go back to um, 13, we know that Abram and, 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 um, and Lot was having their issues with their men. But 13 to 13, it said, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before Yah exceedingly. So just to put the picture back in our mind, that Sodom was a very wicked place. Mm -hmm. And we know they was having issues. But as I was covering last week, what the Most High has for you will be for you. So Abram and his humility, which we covered last week also, him being so very humble was still going to let Lot decide. He didn't say, I'm going to kick you out, or you got to go this way. I'm the one that's in charge. He was going to allow him to choose. Lot looked and chose what appeared to be the best land, where he was not circumspect. The land is good, but what am I going to go through in that land? What manner of man is already in that land? So as Tanaka pulled out this past Shabbat, um, during his two-minute warning, he pulled out the book of Mishli, I think chapter 22, when he was talking about being prudent and watching well till you're going. So what Lot looked at was the uh, the land. The land is good for food. It's got good water source, good water supply. But what he didn't look at was the nature of the manner of the men that already dwelt there. What kind of issues am I going to have in that land? So he didn't even look at that part. And it says here, they were wicked exceedingly before Yah. So that was already going to be his downfall. And now verse 14, again, the, for the focal point, and Yah said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land which you see, to you will I give it and to your seed forever. And I will make your seed as the dust of the earth, you know what I'm saying, so on and so forth. So basically the most I said, now that y'all, you've separated, from Lot, he's going his way, he's made his choice. The place where I told you to come to, anyway, I want you to look all around. No, if south, east, and west, as far as you can see, you own all this. You own all of this, you know? And why is he owned this? For one, the most I told him to go. For two, he's already showed the most high to faith. He left his father's household that was full of wickedness. Yes, Abraham's household was full of wickedness when he left, you know what I'm saying? Because he left as a child went back, left again, and went back and got his father. That's historical writers. We get into that at some other time. But he was willing to go on the faith of the Most High's promise and the Most High's word. And he went not even knowing how this experience was going to be on this total journey. Now moving forward to the 14th chapter, which you've already discussed. When we normally read about Sodom and Gomorrah, we just think of it as being like two cities. But this was more than just two cities of just Sodom and Gomorrah. It was like five different nations they was fighting against here that was confederate that made up what's commonly called Sodom and Gomorrah that was in this battle so now Lot is in this land this land is exceeding wicked he's in the land for a period of time but now the people come through and take everything for him take him captive these wicked people have now overthrown the land there's others that came in wanting the land so now Lot has been taken I heard Kanakia going into as well as Shah Shamar speaking on how it, it takes what type of leadership it takes to be able to lead 300 men. Not only just what type of leadership does it take to lead 300 men, what type of leadership does it take to have 300 men that's your servants, that's trained to plant the land as well as go to war and you are outnumbered. <laughs> You're outnumbered. So what manner of men were these and what manner of leadership was this that Abraham had? So it is now saying to us, and I believe Yamain or someone touched on it a couple of weeks ago, um, or, or, or Zayu, someone touched on it about really Akim. Stepping on my own toes again because I got to get back focused. Um, we have to keep ourselves conditioned. We have to keep ourselves in shape. We have to train 
because it was more than reading the Bible. It was more than reading the Torah and then I'm a Hebrew Israelite. What the Hebrew Israelites actually look like? When we read about our forefathers, these men took care of business. When Gideon went and fought thousands, it was 300. When Abraham went and fought all these other, other uh, kings, it was 300, you know, which meant they had the, the Ruach of Abba Yah with them, but they were also physically fit. Me and Brian was just sitting having a conversation uh, one day this week and talking about we got to get back in shape because imagine when this stuff goes, because things is changing in the world all around us right now. What if we got to go in flight? What if we have to carry someone? Right now, can we walk any distance? Now, can you imagine walking distance, carrying your own body weight, carrying the belongings of your family and having to carry a child or an elder? So our forefathers apparently were physically fit and about that business. So we need to, Akim, we need to really be getting back to it. <laughs> New flash. I just started back this week. I was doing good one time. I just got back to it this week. But this is the manner of men that we see. And so if we're going to say we are the children of Israel, we actually need to start looking like it. They were training. They were, they were just going to be warriors. But if war happened or if someone got taken, we need to be able to go get them back. Now, the thing about it was it shows Abraham still had nothing but love for Lot. Because he, when he, when that one witness got away and came and told Abraham what happened, even though they had the little issue between the herdsmen, there was still no issue the way brothers have today when they just, oh, we had this issue. Now we ain't talking them on. I don't care what happened to them. Or I hope something bad happened to them. It wasn't that type of situation. The herdsmen of Abraham a lot had their issues, but it wasn't really an issue with Abraham a lot per se, where they were just at each other's throat like that. And Abraham still loved his nephew. So to the point, he took 300 men and 300 men were trusted in the most high first and foremost trusted in who they've already been with. Why were they so trustworthy of Abraham? They've already been traveling with him, seeing what the Most High has already been doing for them, believing that they could actually go and succeed in this task. And they went and they succeeded in this task and went to Sodom uh, and they went and defeated and got Lot back and brought him back safely with his belongings. Um, I heard Kanaka touch on something uh, and Kanak, you were actually right. This is the first mention of the word, uh, I saw a tithe in the scriptures, and that word there is tenth. Um, and so when we look here, um, one thing that uh, a lot of people look at today is uh, tithes is livestock. If you had any assembly, they talk about tithes, you should be talking about that. As Kanaka said, when they went and got the spoils of war, all the spoils of war that was brought back, Abraham said he didn't really want none of them. And he said he gave a tithe of all that he came back with. And then there's some that says that where there's no longer a Levitical priesthood. So therefore, there still should be tithes because there's no longer a Levitical priesthood. So Abraham came, he gave tithes uh, of, of all that he had um, to Melchizedek. Uh, Akoti Rose asked, well, what's this comparison of Melchizedek to Mashiach? What does that look like? So we've heard Mashiach be called um, uh, Sar Shalom or Prince of Peace. So when we're reading the text in English and the reason why we labor to study the Hebrew or the Hebrew also is because we actually see the words that's actually there. So shalem actually comes from the root word shalom, or actually to tell you it could be the word shalom itself, which means peace. So it was not really Prince of Salem, it was actually Prince of Shalom or Shalem, you know, which at a vowel point to kind of slightly switch the pronunciation, but it comes from the root word shalom. So Melchizedek was also a prince of peace. So which also Mashiach being called Prince of Peace, um, as some refer to him as. So he's a Prince of Peace. So he was a king or Melech of, of, of Shalom. So he was a king of Shalom at this particular time. He was in a priesthood. Um, and so that's one of the comparisons. The other comparison, as Kanakya said, and before we jump to that comparison, I want to finish um, this. And Ima Shoshana had already touched on this point. And I loved it when, when y'all went back and, and Zakan Yaquab touched this point as well. But when you read um, going forward, um, as he gave to Melchizedek, so Adon Yaquab touched on how he like, nah, y'all ain't make me. I'm not going to be, you're not going to say I took anything. I, I didn't want anything. Don't, nah, y'all can have that. You ain't got to give me that. Only give to the men that fought, give them their portion, uh, the portion that they ate, 
give to them, but I don't need anything. I don't want anything. You know what I'm saying? And so then you jump right to chapter 15, and it said, after these things, the word of Yah came unto Abram in a vision, saying, fear not, Abram, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Adonai Yahuwah, what will thou give me, seeing I go childless? So first highlight I want to look at, we were talking about that fear. We were talking about how our faith is built. Abraham's faith was built in the Most High. The Most High let Abram know, I see your heart. You've been doing all I asked you to do. You've faithfully been walking. You've been, you went through uh, the fear of what you had to go through with the man with your wife. Yeah, you said it was your sister, but you went where I told you to go. You've been walking with me. Now, what I want to let you know right now, Abram, you ain't never got to fear anything. I'm your reward. As long as you're in me and you're doing what I tell you to do and you trust me and you believe me, that's why in the book it says uh, without faith, it is impossible to please him. So in order for us to have faith, faith begins with Abraham. And everyone in this New Testament church age want to say they have faith while not keeping no commandments. You don't have faith. What was faith? What did it look like? Abraham trusted and believed everything the Most High said. He did everything the Most High commanded him to do. He did not eat unclean meat. He kept the feast days. Whatever the Most High said, that's what he did. He trusted and he believed regardless of the odds. That's faith. And without that type of faith, it's impossible to please the most high. So we can't understand the New Testament without understanding the Old Testament. So faith was already defined and, and, and put in a picture form for us to visualize, for us to attempt to get our faith up and see how far we are to our freedom. Because freedom is, holy. hallelujah, freedom is set apart. Freedom is holy, being set apart. So when we are being set apart in Yah, we shouldn't have to fear anything. So y'all let him know, yeah, you ain't have to want anything. You ain't have to worry about anything. You don't have to fear for anything. As long as you have Yah, as long as you have me and you're obedient to me, I am your reward. So while you didn't take anything, I'm going to bless you. But as I can, Yahqua pointed out, Abram asked, all right, well, how you going to bless me, Most I like, what, what you going to give me? I mean, I ain't got a child. A lot of times in the world today, people want to look at blessings as being money, <laughs> new house, new car, and that is blessings also. If God gives it to you, if you need it, and, and you need it for your family, you need extra space, uh, you know, you got to take care of some loved ones. Yes, it says money is a defense, so those things are needed. But in today's society, that's what they look at first. Our forefathers and mothers were looking at wealth as them having children, for their name and generation to continue, for them to fulfill the commandment of being fruitful and multiplying. What will you give me seeing that I go childless? Why is another reason Abram said that? The most high already give him everything. You see, all this land is yours. We already know that Abram, when he went into uh, Mitzrayim and they wanted to take his wife, he already given offerings to Pharaoh or to the king of Egypt at that time. And when they want to go into the chest, for those, we didn't get to read that story for some of you yet, but he also, when they wanted to go into that chest where he was hiding his most prized possession, which was his wife, Abram said, no, 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 you don't know what was in that. I'll give you more silver. I'll give you more gold. I'll give you, he already had money. He already had livestock. He was good. He was already well blessed, but the most high telling him, I'm going to bless you. I'm your reward. Well, how are you going to bless me? Seeing I go childless, he expressed his heart to Yah. I have everything. Really, what I want is a seed. What I want is a child. And then Yah says, I'm going to bless you with an heir. And he thought it was going to be Eleazar, which is help of Elohim. Uh, Elohim is my help, which was a servant who he respected and loved. And that same servant was a righteous servant with Abraham. That's the same one that wouldn't have found um, a, a, a mate for his son, but just moving forward. So it says in four, and um, oh no, verse three, and Abraham said, behold, to me thou has given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir, and behold, the word of Yah came unto him, saying, this shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, look now towards Shemayim and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. I want to now say this in another way. 
You can't count the blessings that I'm about to do to you. Look up at y'all. Y'all go outside. We we try to number the stars. You're gonna be so blessed with the children that you're gonna have. You can't even number the blessings that I'm about to give you, Abraham. You're gonna be the father of many nations, of many children. And even though many children might not have come directly through his loins, once he had that son, that son carried on his house, and and his son having Abraham became the father of many nations because he was the progenitor, and it started with his son. The promised son that the Most High promised him, and he said, "Look, can you also again as I said in the connection gone? Y'all say just in the connection gone. Zakane, uh, Maury, uh, you you you're dragging just a little bit. Okay, acting up on us. All right, close the portal. So." When you look up to numbers, so he also answering in a certain way. That's what the blessing is gonna look. You can't even imagine, you can't even number this blessing. You're gonna be the father of many nations, and now is my family because here this thing originates and he believes yeah. It's and bad, he, right? The connection is bad. bad. Yeah. All right, we, we got to get this. We got to get this in. Hold on, y'all. Hold on. Let me switch devices real quick so I can try to make it to the close. You know, so it's real bad. Oh, that still ain't gonna work. Uh, what about now? Am I still real bad? Loud. Well, that sounds loud and clear right now, Mori. Loud and clear. All right. So it says he believed Yah, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So the faith of Abraham. And they quote this all the time in the Christian church, but they're quoting it from the book of Romans and the book of Hebrews. They're not quoting it from where it originates from, the reason why it even made it into New Testament text, the reason why James and them was talking about the faith of Abraham, because it was something that they knew and understood according to Torah and Tanakh. And this statement starts here. And he believed in Yah, and at this point, Yah counted it to him for righteousness. His trust and his belief in the Most High, regardless of whatever he faced, this is why it was counted to him for righteousness, because he never doubted the Most High. Yes, sometimes it was stressful. Yes, sometimes he didn't know how it was going to work out. But if you say this is what it is, Father, I believe you. If this is what you want me to do, Father, I will do. I have not had a child. I've been without a child. My wife's been without a child for a long time. But if you say I'm going to have many nations and many children, I believe you. And I'm old, but I believe you and I trust you. This is why I was counting for righteousness. And we have to paint that visual picture because he wasn't 16 years old. He wasn't 18. He wasn't 21 years old. He was an old man. And he still believed that Yah said, you're going to have some children in your old age. And he believed that. And that's why I was counting to, to him as righteousness. So this is where faith actually starts for us. This is what faith looks like for us. If we want to see, do we have faith in Yah? We need to come back and read the word of Abraham and say, am I trusting in Yah or am I doubting Yah? Or am I trusting in myself or trusting in man? Man tell me I can't do something that Yah said I can do. Am I going to wait patiently on Yah? Because when you read the text, it took many years for some of this stuff to come to pass. It wasn't next, next day sometimes. It took years, but our forefathers, the righteous ones, they believed and they trusted in the Most High. Moving forward. Uh, just, to, just to go into another thing as I can't y'all call stating, because Mishpachah, when we ask y'all for something, sometimes we need to ask y'all a little bit more questions. Verse 8, and he said, Adonai Yahuwah, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? So you told me I'm going to inherit it. You told me all this is going to happen, but how will I know? So just going on record, still showing that Abraham and our forefathers did ask the Most High. So Mishpachah, in your Teflah, when you pray to the Most High, it is nothing wrong with asking the Most High. And even if it's one of those things of, why me, y'all, when you're going through something, sometimes you ask it in your little pity party. I know I've been asked before, but sometimes you might not like that, you might not like the answer. But the point is you ask it because if you want to know why am I going through this, is it a test or is it something I've done? If you ask y'all why, y'all will reveal to you or ask y'all and start praying more specific prayers. Um, 
me an example. Show me just that. Like, read these texts, read these scriptures, so we learn how to follow or see the sign or the miss a lot of times because you're breaking up again. You're dragging again, Mario. Right. You're dragging again. Yeah. It seems to be like on a cycle, though. It's like you'll go for for seven or, or or ten minutes, and then it starts dragging for a few seconds. Okay, well, we to the ten o'clock mark, so I'm gonna get ready to close out because I started late, but y'all was y'all y'all was getting it in, so I said I wasn't gonna interrupt. So um, so again, so it just shows the faith that he had and what our faith needs to look like, and there is nothing wrong with asking Yah, but because we've been conditioned a certain way, the word actually. You went out again, Moray. Yeah, we hear we hear nothing now. Yeah, we, we, we don't hear a thing at all, Moray. What about now? Can y'all hear me now? Come on. Okay. All right. I'm not gonna keep you much longer. Um uh, you were talking about don't be afraid to ask the most high if we want clarity you know even if you're going through some things Toda, Toda. yeah so um we see that the word shows us that's how our forefathers did they communicated with the most high they asked him the things that they had to ask him you know what i'm saying and for them to get the understanding so it is showing us how to communicate with the most high the most high actually wants us to communicate with him now don't be uh vain in your asking or or disrespectful in your asking, but asking if you're asking with concern and with a, 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 a desire to be pleasing in the sight, uh, to fulfill what he wants you to fulfill, then by all means ask. Because if you don't know, how can you ask some mock and you didn't even ask the most high yet? <laughs> you know, most high, how I'm supposed to do this? And then if I give a lesson, you'd be like, man, I just asked the most high, I just asked the most high this last night, and your lesson went into it, then all oh, how loud, yeah. Because you ask the Most High, you talk to the Most High about it, and in His Word, sometimes the answers come forth. But if you didn't ask the Most High, your ears might not even be conditioned to hear God speaking to you through His Word or through what's going on in the daily goings of what you may see through the course of your day. So our forefathers asked the Most High, so we don't have to be a fearful to ask the Most High. Just don't ask Him anything in vain for vanity's sake, all right? Don't ask a miss. And when you get to the Brick Kadasha, it talks about asking a miss. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get to the conclusion. Jump down to verse, verse uh, so uh, also uh, it says in 12, I'm just going to kind of go through this kind of quickly. Uh, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and then the Most High basically let him know that, listen, even though you're going to have these children, you know, they are going to go into the land of strangers. They're going to be captives. They're going to go through some things. But also that nation in verse 14, also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. So of course we know that Israel, uh, which is gonna be seed of Abraham was in Egypt for a long period of time. But again, remember they were there for a long period of time. So just showing you how the promises of Yah is. So anyone that is going through something in life and if you're asking Yah for things and you feel like things just are not lining up yet and you feel like Yah's forsaking you, Stop doubting Yah. Don't doubt Yah. It just may not be in the timing or you just have not received it yet. But if it's, if it's Yah's will, you will receive it because Abraham's children was in captivity in Mitzrayim for hundreds of years. But Yah had already told Abraham, which is a prophetic word, that this is going to happen to them. They're going to go captives in the lands of strangers. They're going to dwell there. They're going to serve there. But that nation that they serve. I'm going to deal with that nation. I'm going to judge them. And they're going to come from there with great substance. And we know that when Israel left the land of Mitzrayim, they left there with the riches of Mitzrayim. And, and Mitzrayim, commonly called Egypt, was judged by the Most High Almighty. Hallelujah. Jumping down to verse 18. Sneak up. And you shall go, 15. And you shall go to your fathers in Shalom. You shall be buried in a good old age. So it's also let them know, like, I'm letting you know I'm going to bless you. You're going to have many children. You're going to have a good life. You're going to have children as the number of stars in Shemayim that you can't even count. They're going to go into captivity at some point. You're going to die, but you're going to die at a good old age. You're going to go down with your father. So you still going to have a good life. And you shall, uh, but in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. 
for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Uh, dropping down 18, in the same day, Yah made a covenant with Abram saying, unto you, unto your seed, have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Um, so he's letting them know he's made this covenant with them. Now we're jumping forward to chapter 16, and I'm about to get ready to yield because I've already brought most of my points out of 16. Sneak out a moment. So all this is taking place. Then, of course, you know, he, he's, he's letting, letting them know you're going to have this child. Apparently, Sarah, or uh, Sarai, whose name has not been changed yet, is being brought up to speed about the blessing that Yah has promised him. He takes Hagar, um, the handmaid of Sarai. And one thing to note about Sarai, um, handmaid Hagar, as we was covering last week, like I said, still we didn't get to historical writings. Maybe we'll go back and catch up with the historical writings next week before going forward too much further. But Hagar was actually the daughter of the king uh, of, of Mishraim that Abram told uh, that Sarah was his sister. And whenever he had to pray for that land and so on and so forth, then that king was like, man, this is a blessed man. His Elohim is a powerful Elohim. My daughter will be better off with that man. So she gave, the, this man who was in authority in Egypt gave his daughter to another man that's going to be leaving from Egypt because he felt, even though he's a rich man, my daughter is better off with this man because of the power of the God he serves. I've never seen anything like it. So this is who Hagar is. And when you read some of the historical writers about Hagar, it says she was not even short of being like Sarah. So again, she was also righteous. She wasn't an Israelite or she wasn't even a Hebrew per se, but she was still righteous because she was being mentored or tutor, she came up under Sarah. She was taught to be like Sarah. So again, as I was saying last week, Akim, you should have a woman that wants to be under a imam, or older, a gadar, or koti, a sister, to learn Torah, to learn the ways of Yah. If the woman wants to be in the world, that's not for you. It's not for you. Hagar was raised up in culture. Hagar knew Torah also, because Sarah taught her and the historical writers tell us she was not short of being like Sarah, meaning however Sarai was and the writing. You clipped out again, Moray. What's going on? Oh, going on? I, I see your mic is open and, and, and the movement of the mic, but we're not hearing anything. We can hear you now. I just heard you say what's going on. But before that, um, you you cut out after you said she was righteous, brought up under Sarah. Right. So she was trained in the customs, but also the flesh of man and woman, even when we try to be righteous, that issue between her and Sarah is the issues of the flesh, either Sarai's flesh of maybe jealousy coming in because now she has a child and also the flesh of of uh, Hagar with a little entitlement like I'm more than just a handmaid now because I got a child by him so you know I, my status is upgraded whatever that looks like you know that is a little bit fleshly but just I want it to be on note Hagar was also righteous and Hagar also was keeping the Hebraic customs we did not bring along with us people amongst us and let them live how they want to live if you come amongst us, you live how we live. You don't bring your nonsense over here. You have to come over here and be like us. When we go into a land, the most I say, when you go into a land, you do not come after that land. You do not become like that land. You do not try to learn their customs. Don't do it. And I'm trying to hold myself, but I really can't hold myself. Because I know too many of y'all see too many things and we've been addressing things. As a more, you will not hear me teaching about no chakra system. That's wickedness. That has nothing to do with the most high. A chakra has nothing to do with the Ruach HaKodesh. And if any more is teaching that, they need to be shut down, as I've already told them. It's wickedness. And because I know y'all know this more, and y'all have been seeing it, because some of y'all been coming to read this mess, that's not what we teach. Yah says, I am alone. You do not associate anybody with me and nothing. Nothing is associated with the most high. 
And if any man is going off following a woman, a Jezebel, or whatever they're following, more or not, and a brother who I love or not, we don't teach that nonsense. That's off. The Ruach is not an energy that's compared to a chakra. The Ruach is the spirit of the most high. Do chakras exist? Yes. But as a moray, I would not teach that to a Knesset. A priest is supposed to teach the difference between clean and unclean. Everything in the world exists regardless of if it do exist, it's because of Yah and Yah alone. And I'm angry with Yah's anger. And since they said it live, I'm saying it live. Some more going to say something about it. Yes, more is saying something about it. And I'm saying it privately with us before I go live. But if that nonsense keeps coming out, I'm sorry, Mr. Colin Shabbat, but because I know y'all see this mess, don't think that y'all shepherds are sitting by not trying to love our brother and telling him about the sin that he's in. Zakane Yaquab directly on the post said something. They're erasing the post of the righteous brothers that's telling you to take that mess down. And we don't stand with it. We don't support it. And he's not a Mori in our sight. He's stripped of that title in our world. Now, back to the script. That's wickedness. It has nothing to do with Yah. We do not associate anything with our father. And yes, I have an understanding of some of everything that's going on in this world. But I understand enough that Yah says, when you come into a land, don't try to learn their customs and their ways. And don't associate anything with me. My name and my name alone reign supreme. Now what I will say is, y'all pray for the op that he returns from darkness before the most high judge him. And with that, Mishlakash, that is the reason why I wanted us to see according to Torah, they did not bring unclean women with Abraham to be with them. You had to already be tutored and trained up keeping the customs. The most I say, when y'all going to a land, you tear down everything about that land. Don't try to learn the customs, learn the Torah. And if you learn the Torah, you see you ain't got no time and no business studying that other nonsense. Taking away the glory and esteem of the most high God who said he would not share his glory with another. And with that, Mishra Khan, I pray and hope everyone got some wisdom, knowledge and understanding. So I know sometimes Y'all may not see things because we do do things in love, because we do love our brothers and we love our sisters that go off and we try to handle things in a closed environment. But whenever you're telling someone to stop putting this stuff up and they're still putting it up, then I know the sheep is asking, why the mores ain't saying nothing? Why they ain't doing nothing? We are. And it's being ignored. That's darkness. So now if it's being ignored, it's now time for us to talk about it because now Yah's name has been associated with some nonsense and I can't let that slide. So with that, Mr. McCall, I'm sorry to do that on Shabbat, but it's too much nonsense going up on Shabbat. And because some of y'all seeing this stuff, stop liking on stuff you don't understand. And if it does not have to do with Torah, flee from a wickedness. Flee from Shatan and he will flee from you. With that, Mr. McCall, I yield if there are any words, questions, comments, please, by all means, I now yield the floors to the elders and the emails. Um, elders and imams, and imams and elders first, and then I open the floor to everyone else. With that, I say say lie. I just like to say it was a told study and very well edified, and I like to commend Kanak on how well he edified uh, tonight as well. Or if you're speaking, uh, you, you clipped out again. Okay, go ahead, Mark. Hey, Zakane, because the internet is going really horrible, as you see the hands, acknowledge them, and you take it from here, Zakane, because this internet is really acting up. Come on, Maury. Toda, toda. Hello, ya, Ima. Hello, ya, Ima. Uh, I, I concur with you, too. Uh, uh, don't knock ya. He, he, he's, uh, oh yeah, <laughs> he's coming on in there. He's coming on in there. I like the way he, uh, he uh, edified the, the, the word tonight. It was a blessing. Hallelujah. Imam Shoshana. 
Shalom, shalom, Shabbat shalom. I agree. Kanakia, you did a very excellent job in promo provoking um, thought and conversation between us all. And I um, also like how Moray brought in what I was had my hand raised for about how uh, um, Ishmael was um, had a spirit of rejection as well as what, how father created him, the, the wildness that he created him, it just aggravated it and, and just set fire to it. Whereas he became the way he was. So yeah, tobe, tobe lesson. Toda, I yield. Hell oh, yeah. Toda, Ima. Toda for those wise words. Shabbat shalom. Uh, Iman Newkirk, Shabbat Shalom, Floor George. I just want to say also, I like uh, how Kanakia and your one of words to, uh, tonight. And uh, they encourage us to be, to have the faith of Abraham. And we have the faith of Ab Abraham. We get the blessings of Abraham. And I just want to thank and praise uh, Morai Samak, how he brought that word out and how he taught at the end about how we should live and not take on the customs and the stuff of other other people and we have to make a stand we go either we're gonna live right or we're not i am hello yeah more words of wisdom hello yeah and 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 like you said ima um um and we brought that out in several lessons starting with uh more ray baruch you know um freedom is 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 holy <laughs> and that holy is set apart man we can't be mixing uh other cultural especially when we're talking about ruah you know we we don't we don't do that we're set apart and the most high is our everything we don't need anybody else's customs and and, and religious practices blending in and like more eloquently brought out man the most high already told us i will not share my glory with anybody you know, so don't try and compare uh, somebody else's rituals and, 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 and customs, and especially when we're talking about Ruach, to the Most High. Hello, yeah. Iman Shoshana, is that an old hand or? or? It's a new hand. I also uh, wanted to point out about us not leaning to our own understanding and how we are to ask the Father on every given matter no matter how little, how big it is, how small, how tiny, how minute we may think it is, we need to ask the Father concerning our lives and the Torah and I walk with him each and every time anything comes up before us. I yield. Hallelujah. Baruch Hashem. Bless his name. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, Ima Audrey. Is my hand raised? No, ma'am. I just wanted to make sure the floor was available to you. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I did. I did want to add something. I have always questioned, yeah. Um, I, I, as a child, I've always questioned him, and, and elderly people used to always say, "You don't question the father," you know. But I've always questioned him, and when my husband died, I had so many questions for him, and. Once he answered my questions through either scripture or through other people, what have you, that was what gave me peace. So um, it's good to question him, especially when you don't have a good understanding of what's going on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and, uh, like you said, Ima, if you want clarity, if you want clarity, there's nothing. I mean, just like if your dad, your, your earthly father told you to do something and you're not sure what it is that 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 you, you need to ask, how, 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 how am I supposed to do this? Or how will I know that this is what you want me to do? How will I know that this is from you? You know, like when, when Abraham was asking, how will I know that 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 the, the blessing, <laughs> you know, so, so that I know that it's from you, definitely from you, 
you know, halal ya, toda, toda for that ima. Any zakanin. Halal ya. Um, ima new Kirk, I see your hand up. Yes, for my peace. Enjoyed everything this evening. This as was so profoundly said, lean not to your own understanding. But in all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path. If you don't do that, you're gonna end up producing something wild. <laughs> Hello, yeah. Hello, Toda, Toda Zake. <laughs> and, and I wanted to bring out um, a point too. You know, um, Maurice Mock said about the historical writings, and I'm, I'm sure he's going to get into that, you know, especially um, the, the how the relationship kind of soured for a while between uh, Sarah and, and Hagar. Um, you know, and, and that's a lesson to us too, you know, that, that uh, even like Lot, even even at lot, you know, um, you have to consider all the aspects of, of your choices. <laughs> you have to consider all the aspects of your choices, you know, and, and, and because whether they're good consequences or bad consequences, you know, um, there, there are, you have to consider all of that and, and, and weigh the odds, you know, um, like Hagar, you know, and Sarah. It wasn't like I, I, you know, the way I read it, and, you, and you'll see it in the historical writings when when Moray go through that too. That I, I don't believe she 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 kind of got a little, you know, there is pride in that, but I don't think she was directing it directly at Sarah. But because Sarah saw it, you know, uh, just like in human nature, you know, it's like, well, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't, I I'm not getting that. Uh, in her mind, her perception, I'm not getting that that uh, glory, you know, um, because I don't have a child, you know. Um, but but like like uh, Abram told her, look, that this is this is the consequence of your choice. That will do what you need to do to to make it right inside you, <laughs> you know. But but the Most High fixed all of that, you know. The Most High fixed all of that. Um, one more thing was. Um, we see Moray brought that out too, how, how Lot saw the grass greener, but he didn't really consider what was going on in the land where he, he decided to take his, his uh, herdsmen and his sheep, you know? But, but if we uh, look at the, the scripture, the most I told Abraham to arise and walk through all that land, survey all that land so you know what's going on in all that land and you know how to operate properly uh, throughout your whole land. You know, um, and, and so there's, there's um, to me, there's a whole lot of lessons in here that we need to take note of when, when we're trying to walk uh, after the, the, the likeness of the most high. And we're trying to um, be the uh, image and the likeness of the most high, you know, in, in righteousness and um, discernment. And discernment. Hello, y'all. Tob, Tob, lesson, both from uh, Kanakya and, 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 Maurice Samak and his edification and all of us that that participated and gave um, uh, our, our edification, our understandings. Uh, Toda, Toda, this was a great, great, great lesson. Um, I'll yield. I see uh, Adon Michael, floor is yours. I want to say all praise to the most high. Um, I've been dealing with some things, um, health issues and things the last couple of weeks. Um, however, I've still been in fellowship with the Most High. I'm just so grateful tonight that um, he has been keeping me and he's been helping me. He's been faithful to me. And it's just so good that even though I hadn't been online on several occasions, it's like tonight. Have you ever like been like you had like a thirst? And when you got that water, it was cool and refreshing water. And that's how it's always been for me in this Knesset. And just tonight, the water was just so cool 
and it was just so refreshing to my soul. So I just say, oh, praise the most high. I say hallelujah, hallelujah, for the truth that continues and continues to march on in this assembly. I give y'all all the praise. I yield. Hallelujah. Toda Rabbah for the words. Toda Rabbah. Hallelujah. All praise of mine. Like he said, in all things, you know, in all things, give thanks to the most high. Um, there was one more point. I don't see any hands right now, but one more point I wanted to make too. When Moray was, was talking about um, the submission and, and, and taking on uh, multiple wives and all of that, you know, Moray Samak and I had a conversation before too on those same lines, you know, and, and it brought out how um, a vow is a vow, is a vow, it, you know, um, whether we're um, vowing sort of like, I don't want to put it like exclusively the Torah, but if, if you make a vow, you have to honor that vow. And if we got married under the vows that we normally do in this country, you know, if you said to your Isha that I will forsake all others and cling unto you, you know, those, those, those ritual, uh, I don't want to say ritual, but the standard um, marriage vows, then you made a vow to your Isha. You know, you made a vow to your Isha that you would forsake. Now, <laughs> it, it, you know, you've got to go back to a to discussion. Um, but you made the vow, if, if she's not down with multiple wives, you already made that vow that you would cling to her and forsake all others. You know, so uh, um, good points brought out on that when the most when Moray Samak was talking about um, multiple wives and 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 understanding Torah, you know, but a vow is a vow is a vow. I yield. And Moray Samak, if you uh, if you can get back on, I yield. Um, if you want to come back on, or, or we can go ahead and close out. Well, actually, the floor is open um, to anyone now. The floor is open, and and then we'll close. Shashmar, floor is yours. Shalom, can you hear me? Yeah, I just want you all praise to the most high, you know, for allowing the don't cannot get and also yourself and more to mark to bring out the lesson. I also benefited from the brothers and sisters that brought out their points. Uh, one thing I took from the lesson was, um, you know, just consistency, endurance with the most high, whether it be, you know, um, like in our relationship as far as marriage or going to going through a situation like war or, you know, anything, you know, just be consistent with the most high, you know, keep him close, you know, um, he will not fail. And I also, you know, I just posted a, a precept in the chat. It's uh, Matthews or Medithayahu, uh chapter five, verse six. And it says, um, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. And that's what to bring that out. But I, I yield all praise to the most high, yeah. Hallelujah, Toda, Toda. Praise the Most High in all things, you know, and and good pull on that Matthew Yahoo, Matthew. Bait Francis, floor is yours. Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. Um, Hello. I praise Hello. Yah for for this um, for answered prayers even conversations, um, the way that Moray, first of all, Hanakia, that was amazing. Very good job. Uh, and and all, all the wisdom, all the wisdom from the, um, from, uh, from everybody who participated. Um, and then also um, when Moray, uh, Moray came in with uh, answering questions that weren't even asked and even, and that's how I, I know this, this assembly is just so blessed how me and my each were having a conversation about um, something as, as small as uh, the tribe, you know, and, and how does it work when a woman marries outside of her tribe? Is she that or this? Like every conversation, um, every, uh, I'm sorry, look, I'm getting a little bit excited, but I, I just praise y'all for, for this assembly. Um, this was a really good message. I learned a lot. Um, and and I just want to say thank you all. Please continue to stay in Yah and let the Ruach use you because it's it's really helping. I can't speak for everybody, but I can definitely speak for myself. 
Um, praise Yah. Yeah, hallelujah. You know, you just attest to what Maurice is my saying. You know, you you uh you have your discussion and then you pray to the most high and and, and um be listening out for the answer, you know, just like you were you were saying, you all were just having a discussion about um marriage outside of the tribe and all of that, and then the, the more covers it in his lesson. Um so hallelujah, yeah, that's a testament, to, you know. Uh, seek the most high, like um, um, Shashamar just brought out too. Seek the most high uh, in, in all righteousness, you know. Hello, yeah. Um, Maurice Mock, if you want to try and, and, and I want to make sure that you have uh, closing argument, I mean, closing statements um, before we actually close out, if you, if you can, if your computer is working. Uh, well, I'll keep it very short and brief. I just want to give all honest thing to the most high. Um, I really enjoyed it just sitting back listening tonight. And, you know, I didn't let Kanak know I was on because he would have stopped if he'd known I was on. So I was listening uh, pretty much the whole time. And I just really enjoyed uh, the conversation that you all were having, um, how y'all was going through the word together. And that's what it's all about. The most high say, study to show that self approved. And y'all had a very good discussion tonight and it motivated me. And I'm just so thankful for the Ruach that Yah's placed upon each and every one of us and giving us an understanding of his word. Um, every one of you, y'all did a great job. Uh, Akoti Jen put some big facts in there, some historical stuff about the land and stuff like that. Just everything that everyone was bringing out. You, you know what I'm saying? Y'all y'all all had a piece of it and the Ruach was flowing. So all praise, honor, esteem be to the most high. Uh, Barak is Kodash name. I definitely enjoyed this Shabbat Eve, um, you know, and just continue to study to show thyself approved. Work men and women need not to be the shame, right to divide the word of truth. Selah, hallelujah. I'll turn it over to uh, Sarah Yohanan if he would do the closing Tefla. Okay. As all lines are clear, you got to face to the east. Hallelujah. 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 That's the highest praise. We give you the highest praise, Abiyah. Because you is the only Elohim, the only creator, the only power. And we, your children, don't associate anything with that power. We want to say Toda Yah for another Shabbat Eve, Abba for another week of work, of rest. And anything that your children were doing through this week before the Shabbat, Abba, we want to say told our Yah because we are here as we came in another Shabbat together, Abba. Because of your love and your mercies that you continue giving us your children. Told our Yah for giving us another day to get it right with you, Abba. Because every time we get to open our eyes and breathe that breath of life, Abba, it's another day to get it right with you, Abba. So Abba, let your children hear your voice, feel your spirit, and learn your Torah so that we are able to fight the wives of the adversary that surround us, that try to attack us, that tries to steer us away from you and follow doctrines and customs that is not a you, Abba. Let your children and folk on the earth, Abba, Not association with you with all vulnerable things, Abba. Let your ones that call themselves shepherds or leaders or mores, bishop, pastor, whatever they want to call themselves, Abba. Mislead your children, mislead your sheep on the wrong path, Abba. Let your leaders. Lead your children, your sheep, to the righteous path, Abba. 
Aber, on my behalf, Aber, I just want to say, Toda Ya Aber, for the state trials of me and my Isha Aber, that we made it to Moray Shemak House safely, Aber. As you have been seeing Aber through the year, Aber, I've been a, I've been a traveling person, Aber. And you have been giving me travel mercy, me and my Mr. Kyle. So I just want to give you the highest theme, Abba, and praise of Abba, because you are so faithful to your children, Abba. You continue serving us, Abba, when we should be serving you, Abba. Abba, you are the power of Salon, the power of peace. You are the power of love. You are our salvation. Um, yeah. And there's none other than you. Told us for our birth parents. Told us for our forefathers, Abba. As Abraham was a perfect example how to lead Abba. If he led them 300 men, his servant that he trained under the power of you, Abba. That we, your children from the four corners of earth got to get ready for battle, Abba. Because the adversary is making his move, Abba. Because the adversary know that his time is coming to an end. So let your children be battle ready, Abba. Like Abraham had his household battle ready, Abba. Ready to co combat that wickedness, combat the adversary, combat your time, Abba. Your time is out there doing his job, Abba. And now it's time for us, your children, to do our job, Abba, and rebuke. Shatan Abba, and turn back to the custom in the ways of our Elohim, the set apart Israel, the Holy One. You are set apart, Abba. And we should be set apart as you command us. Abba, ask you for your healing hands, Abba, for the sick, Abba. Heal your children that are sick, Abba. Open the eyes and the hearts of your children, Abba, that don't know you, Abba. To bring them to you, Abba, like you woke a lot of us, your children, for the four corners of earth, Abba. Wake them, Abba. Bring them on the narrow and the straight path, Abba. Continue putting strength in our leaders, our mores, Abba. As they have a tough task, Abba. Trying to lead your children the righteous way to you, Abba. With any misleading doctrine, Abba. Told her, yeah, for our elders, Abba. Continue getting our elder, elder strength, Abba, to be that guiding light to the young generation, to continue guiding the young generation to that light of salvation, which is you, the Holy One of Israel. Continue watching over all the brothers, all the sisters, Abba, all our children, Abba, we ask you for your continual hair protection. And as a family, as a Mishpachah, Abba, yeah, let them know that we need to come together, Abba. If anything is going on with us, if the adversary is attacking us, that we feel that we could come to our Mishpachah, and have them pray for us, have them lift our spirits up, Abba, and help us with any type of need that we have, Abba. 
because we all are Mr. Ka Allah's. Mm. Alba, it's, it's so hurtful sometimes, Alba, to see some of your children, Alba, walking in the ways of Shatan, Alba. But we have continued prayer for them, Alba. And leave the judgment in your hands, Abba. Because you will judge the earth, Abba. But we that's in the light, that's following your Torah, could give them the instructions how to come back to you. But judgment, we leave it in your hands, Abba. May Yah protect your household. May Yah protect your family. And may Yah continue shining that His protection over you. Blessed be you, Yahuwah Elohim. Blessed be the name of Yahuwah Elohim. And bless who come in the name of Yahuwah Elohim. And everyone on the line say, Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 We love you all. May you enjoy the rest of your night. May the most I watch over us protect you. Uh, we look forward to uh, the AM service. We look forward to all those that will be here. And for those that will still be online, we're looking forward to our continued service. So get you some rest. Enjoy your families. We love you all. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. May the most I continue to bless you on this Shabbat. Hallelujah. Shabbat Shalom. I have you all. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.